spread about slurs. How he used to run me, because he's from where I'm from. How he used to run me out of his yard, because I was the biggest drug dealer. I was the biggest drug dealer in my community, and my community didn't want me there. But I had a surrounding of people that wouldn't tell on me. Wouldn't tell. And that's why I'm here today to tell y'all, don't get confused with snitching. Snitching is when a criminal, me, and I'm gonna use you again, hey, no, I'm using Cass. Me and Cass <laughs> agree to go rob a bank. Me and Cass, we talking in the house. Cass said, okay, Smurf, I'll drive and you go. I said, no, I'm a team fan. <laughs> Smurf, you drive and I'll go in the bank. <laughs> okay? You drive and I'll go in the bank. <laughs> and whatever the proceeds is, we're gonna split them down the middle. You get half and I get half. Nobody's role in this crime is bigger than that. So me and Cass go and we do good. We hit the bank with our little mask on and Raphael and James got us on the news at five. And all y'all looking at us say, boy, if I can figure out who this is, I might get a few dollars. You know? And we get away with it. But now we ain't satisfied with that. So we go to John Gallon, to the little small bank y'all got with all your money in it. And we said we're going to do this one more time. And we do it. Get away with it. But Cass, because I told him not to buy all that jewelry, he goes out there and buys them big gold chains and new rings and all them stuff. And the police get behind him. Now he get caught. Okay? Do you think if Cass tell him he's doing it to better our community? No! Cass tell him it because he want to get out. And he's serving me up. That's snitching. But when someone kills someone's son in this community, right. and one of y'all see it in your town, that's not snitching. All right. All right. That's living under God's law. That's not snitching. So really, to all your little brothers, you know, who like to listen to that music that guys talk about, they lying. These dudes is cowards. They're lying. That lifestyle they're talking about, they're lying. They're trying to make money. Mm -hmm. And if selling violence is how they do it, they're going to sell it. Right. And when y'all start playing into it, when mama tell you to wash the dishes and you can't wash it, I already see the world you hit down. Amen. I already see it. Amen. So I'm humbly, because I know I went over 10 minutes, but they talk longer than me. Tell the truth now. <laughs> they talk longer than me. They talk longer than me. You know that. You in the front seat. You see how long the boy for. I'm not asking you as a pastor or a radio personality. I'm going to do it again now, don't be mad. As a senator and as a homicide survivor victim, I'm asking you all from a thug's perspective. A person who was out there polluting your community. The ones who was creating this mess to simply help me clean it up. Peace. Oh, man. I forgot to warn y'all about this gentleman I was about to bring up. The energy he was going to bring, this is what we're talking about right here. It's easy to talk about this stuff, but you need actual people that can help bring it home, and you definitely brought it home right there. As we get ready to close out, I don't even know how to follow that up. I can't follow with that energy. Sometimes I'm like that on the radio. He say when I when I get that look in my eye and I start going, I guess he's taking a page from me there, but I, I doubt that seriously. Uh, the follow-up on a couple of things he said that I thought was really interesting is, you know, when, when these gentlemen, they get in front of the judge, you know, we, we've seen it on the news, and they, they start crying. And they're like, oh, they're not tough, they punks and all that. I took it from a different perspective. I took it from the perspective that actually Smurf kind of talked about a little bit, and that was, no, I think they were crying because reality actually sets in yeah. now of what yeah. they're about to face. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. We need to get to them before that point. Yeah. Another thing he mentioned, I want to mention, because he, he mentioned about robberies. So because I'm in music and stuff, this is a true story. Some of you may have heard me speak about it, but there was actually two prominent rappers in the 80s. They were at the height of their careers at their game, making good money and everything. They decided to rob a bank. You know, innocently enough, but unfortunately, and these are, you know, you hear about these rappers, as he said, and they're not doing what they say they do. These two actually did it, and 
it was a robbery gone bad because they killed a lady cop who actually was a young lady just starting out in the force, but not only that, she had a young kid at the time. Now, she's orphaned, unfortunately. And I say that to say, so unfortunately, this prominent rapper making all this money, he's in jail for life at the age of 22. Never gonna see the light of day. Now, the other one, who I believe was the actual gunman, is scheduled to be executed. And actually, I believe he's scheduled uh, to be executed either in March or April. Now, he had a stay at execution. He was supposed to be uh, executed on March 9th, ironically, which is uh, Biggie Smalls and Notorious B.I.G. is when he was murdered. So I find that kind of eerie within itself. But to know that these two young men who made good money in this music actually now are faced with the reality of one losing his life. Unfortunately, no one is in this at all and the other one in jail for life. So I thought that was interesting when he talked about the uh, robberies. And uh, finally, you know, I did want to mention also when it comes to uh, snitching. Another true story. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Now, I was driving back from Walterboro, and this is, let's say, about 10 years ago. And now, this is a true story. I never really followed it up, so it's my fault. But it's so mind-boggling that I, I just, I gotta get it out because I don't want to waste any more time so we can close here in a minute. So the, inter the, the lady was interviewing the gentleman, and she asked, well, why are you wanting to interview now? Because he's saying, I didn't do it. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, well, you didn't do it, but you've been in jail all this time and you're set to be executed. Why are you just coming out this with now? I think y'all know where I'm going with this. Because he said he didn't want to snitch and he wanted to be a legend in the street, so he was going to give up his own life. Ain't that something? And so when he talks about this, it just resonates heavily of where our young kids' mindset is that they're willing to give up their own life before they give up somebody that does not need to be polluting our communities and probably gonna go on to do something even more heinous. So I hope those words really resonated with what he said because it did with me because I was able to attach it with so many different true stories. I'm actually gonna follow up this story just to see if the gentleman actually was executed or whatever happened with that. So with that being said, we're gonna get ready to close things out. I, I thank you all for taking the time and sitting through all the different words and words that you've heard up here. And like everybody said, just a tremendous amount of folks that came out. Did I forget? No, I didn't forget you, sir. I didn't forget you. No. This is the last gentleman we got to bring up here. And of course, he will, uh, I guess, have everybody come up at the end as well. But he's going to lead us with, if you will, some closing remarks here as we get ready to get out of here. So let's give it up once again for Pastor Dixon. And if I can say this about this gentleman again, I, did, I haven't known him that long. I can't believe first we had Smurf putting throwing me under the bus talking about we've talked so long up here and then now you think I would forget you. But what I want to say about these two gentlemen, every time I look and I took the initiative to actually have them on my show without even getting approval because I thought it was important to have their voices on the air because I've seen they're so actively in the community, don't matter what it is. It ain't gotta be just what we're doing here today. Whatever the situation is, I know in my Pleasant, the young uh, white boy that was uh, stabbed to death. Uh, Y'all know about that story, right? For, for you know, some misunderstanding with this modern technology, whatever you call FaceTime or whatever it is. But the bottom line is, key words, young white boy. Ain't got nothing to do with us. Oh, yes, it does. And he was standing before him and his family as well, just to show the amount of respect that this gentleman, along with Smurf and everybody up here, has for the community as a whole. So once again, let's give it up to Pastor Dixon. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I hope y'all have learned today. <laughs> Before I proceed, which I'm, I'm going to be extremely brief because we're into that solutions area, but before I touch on it, I want to briefly first off apologize to Sergeant Harold Phillips of the Charleston County Police Department and Sheriff's Office, excuse me, 
for him to lose his in a lieutenant Dan <laughs> All I can say is I gave you a promotion yeah. in the same manner that our new senator in the house yeah. is not one. We end up uplifting around here, can you understand? Yeah. We don't tear nobody down. No. If you need a, a, a raise, if you need a new position, if you need a new place in society, please come see us. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge Ms. Easter LaRoads over here, yes, South yes, Carolina, yes, Texas yes. advocate. Yes. So, I don't know how she does what she does because she has to deal with a lot more when it comes to up close and personal dealing with the pain that we heard from today. Okay, a lot more. Um, DJ Cass, thank you so very much, brother. Y'all give a listen to Mar Knight, Hip Hop Factory, Hip Hop, D93. Papa Smurf and myself will be accompanying DJ Cass tomorrow evening. Mr. Arthur Chisholm, thank you for coming out. My good friend, Mr. John Henry back there. Save Our Family and Youth Annual March representative, CEO, Chief. Okay, all right. Now before I, I, I close down, because uh, Deacon Middleton is standing behind me back here. She had checked the watch four or five times already. And I know when they get behind you, watch out. But before I leave, we've, we've heard about solutions, okay? We've heard about some solutions. We heard from Deputy Chief Tony Elder about some things that law enforcement is doing. We heard uh, about Real Mad and the website that they have available, uh, www.projectunityusa.org. Please use that website if you know anything about anybody at any time in history. There's a lot of cold cases out here that need to be solved. A lot of mothers are still crying because they don't know who did what to their child. Help them out. Please help me out. The redefining of snitch. I don't even like to come to a microphone after Smurf. <laughs> straight up. I'm going to tell you straight up. I don't like to come to a microphone behind a Smurf because he put it down. Ain't nobody in here say they don't understand this thing about snitching. And that if you call in and report something that you ain't been involved in, that ain't snitching. Exactly. If I can understand it, you can understand it. Now finally, in solutions, I want to talk about something that we're going to need everybody's support on. And when you approach your state representatives, your senators, your councilmen, your law enforcement officers, we need to talk about something called Project Exile. This program was implemented in 1998 in Richmond, Virginia. There was a problem like we have with homicides in Richmond, Virginia. And they felt like desperate times called for desperate measures. And so what they did was, and before I go any further, I want to tell you all that I am not pro-incarceration. I am not, but once again, desperate times call for desperate measures. 1998, Richmond, Virginia decided to partner up with the federal government, and what they did was they imposed extremely stiff penalties for anyone caught illegally possessing a firearm. Let me tell you something about the murders that's happening in our community by firearms. They're not being killed with guns that people went into a gun shop and purchased and registered and all of that. No. They're illegally possessed firearms. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a high percentage of the murders that we are dealing with. They're done by people who have got a gun who are not supposed to have a gun. So what Richmond did was they said, okay, we're gonna fix this problem. Anybody that's caught, anybody, grandma, the pastor, school teacher, no, no, Pookie now, Ray Ray, anybody who is caught with a pistol that is not legally registered to them is going to prison. Mm. And they're going to prison for five years. Average, average sentencing in Project Exile was 56 months. 
average citizen. And when I say go to prison, I mean, we're not sitting in no county jail waiting on no trials. Three hots and a cot just chilling over there, got a canteen worrying your folks and caring all about putting something on my book. <laughs> yeah, I've been up that road too, I got a number. No, when they were caught, they were shipped. If there's a trial necessary, do it up the road. Because there's one thing about it, if the law said don't possess a gun illegally and you get caught, you're, be, you're guilty. Have the trial up, up the road. The statistical value of this whole thing is within the first 10 months in Richmond, Virginia, they saw a 41% drop in violent crime, in gun-related crime. 41% in the first 10 months. There's a 93-page exit report that shouts out the validity of this program and how well it did. It did so well and it was so unthreatening to those gun proponents, the NRA, you don't know them, the ones that say, if you say anything about taking our gun rights away, we're going we to raise game. We'll spend money. The NRA donated money into the foundation to support Project Exile because they realized it was valuable and making the community safe. Well, it's time for us to bring Project Exile to South Carolina. We want to stop the bloodshed in our communities. One piece of the puzzle, that's not the whole puzzle, but one piece of the puzzle is bringing Project Exile in South Carolina form, not boarded down, not broken down, but in its full strength, even strengthened, bring it to the state of South Carolina. Give them a three-year period of advertisement or a one-year period of a six-month period of advertising. It's coming, y'all. Get ready. And when your 13-year-old walks out here with a gun and gets stopped by chance by law enforcement, you'll see him when he's 18 years old. That's the next time you'll see him. We do a couple of folks like that, two, three, five, ten people like that. We're going to get through the, go through the community, y'all. Hey, hold this gun for me, man. Is you crazy? Are you out of your mind? I ain't got it to lose like that. I just had a baby. He'd be in kindergarten by the time I see him. I, I ain't trying to feel that. I just got married. That's right. That's right. Five years, my wife, That's right. she gone. That's right. Everybody ain't saved, y'all. <laughs> I just want to put that out as the solution that we're going to, you're going to hear more about this. We'll be talking to our legislators about this, not only here, but statewide. We, we, we started an effort up at uh, um, SC State about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, with the student population to galvanize the entire state behind this so we can push this thing through. But it's not, it's going to take a lot more than us. It's going to take the communities, not just this community, not just Wadmala, Johns Island. It's going to take James Island, Ravenel. It's going to take Smokes. It's going to take Hilton Head. It's going to take everybody in the state, Darlington, everywhere, Florence, Greenville, in order to make sure that when we go to put this thing through, ain't no senator this or representative that standing around saying, well, I think we should do this to the bill. I think we should take that out of the bill. I don't really think this is good for the people. Well, they were elected of the people, by the people, and for the people, and it's time for the people to stand up and say, enough is enough, and then we will take our suits back, and it's not going to do it, just like the things I was going to do, and then we're going to push it through. So we're just asking everybody, please, keep your eyes and ears open. Report crime. Don't let it happen anymore around you without you saying something. Encourage others to do so. Explain snitching to them, please. And when the bills come out, when the, when the bills start going through, get behind them. Tell your pastors. Tell your pastors. It's in the Bible. Do right. That ain't no passage. But you start in Genesis 1 and end in Exodus 22. And that's what it says in a nutshell. Do right. So tell your pastors to get behind it too. Now I'm gonna let, I'm gonna turn the mic over to the this. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. I know. I gotta quit too. 
<laughs> you good? Well, um, Ms. Middleton uh, asked me to pass on the fact that we do have a, a car that's blocking someone 